There is a Facebook post that has been popping up from time to time over the last few months that raises the question as to whether or not COVID-19 is the latest of God's plagues being visited upon the land. Sort of a plague number 11, if you're keeping count. And in true tribute to the insanity in which we live these days, there is a Republican and a Democratic version of that same post, attributing to the other the reason why God might visit a plague upon the land. All that insanity aside, it is intriguing to revisit that story in light of what we are going through these days, of returning to the land of Egypt, where God's people are languishing under the lash of Pharaoh. In all of the times that I've read and studied that story, it has only been in these months that it has struck me that God's people suffer alongside their Egyptian counterparts. They are not spared the gnats, the flies, the frogs, the rivers of blood, etc., etc. But they are forced to endure them right along with their Egyptian neighbors. It will not be until that final plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn, that they are separated. What separates them is a meal and a mark. They are called to prepare a ritual meal, a sacrifice, if you would. The book of Exodus goes into great detail on how that meal is to be prepared and how the blood of the lamb that is to be used for the meal is to be placed on the doorpost and the lintel of their houses so that that evening as the angel of death sweeps through the land it will see the mark of the blood and will pass over that house and that is indeed what happens and God's people are set free. It is a story that becomes a perpetual ordinance within the life of faithful Jews down to this day. A remembering of the story of those days of tribulation and trial in Egypt and how God delivered them. It's to be told always because God's people will indeed face similar times of trial and tribulation in the future. And it is important for them to remember the story of how God delivered them, even in the face of uncertainty in overwhelming odds that they would not survive. It is not a surprise then that the early Jewish Christians remember that story as they begin to make sense out of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They too separate themselves from the Jewish brothers and sisters in a meal and a mark. The meal is remembrance of the Passover meal. The meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed. It differs from the Jewish Passover in that the Passover lamb, Jesus, is both host and meal. We call that meal in the Christian tradition the Eucharist or Holy Communion. The mark is the mark we receive in baptism on our foreheads. It is there after we have been water washed that we are marked and sealed with the cross of Christ. 
a remembrance of who we are and the claim that God has placed upon us and the promise that God makes that in the midst of trial and tribulation, we cling to that cross. We cling to our identity and the promises that God has made to us. In those earliest days of COVID, when the whole world stopped, I found that mark to be a source of great comfort and hope in the midst of the anxiety and fear that I was feeling. It was easy to do so because we were coming right off the heels of Ash Wednesday. And there was still a faint trace of ashes on my forehead. A reminder of my own mortality, but also a reminder of that cross from baptism, of God's promises for me, and his promise to be with me in the midst of all trials and tribulations. A promise that would save me from all danger, wrath, and even death. It is that mark that I have clung to as I, we have gone through these times of uncertainty and crisis. Especially in those days when we could not celebrate that ritual meal. And even now, there are many places that still have not opened Others are not celebrating the meal. And most of us are not celebrating in the way that we once did in full fellowship. And so it has reminded me of how important the story is to remember as we face times of trial and tribulation, as we face the plagues of these days. There is a beautiful story told by Eile Weissel, the author and survivor of the Nazi concentration camps. He tells the story of the great famous Rabbi Baal Shem Tov, how when he was faced with trials for his community, he went to a place in the forest, lit a fire, and said a prayer of intercession to God, asking God to spare his people. And God did. Years later, when his replacement faced a similar time of trial, he went to the forest, and he spoke to God saying, I cannot remember how to light the fire but I remember the prayer. And the disaster was averted. Years go by, and another rabbi faces similar times of trial. He goes to the forest and prays to God that he no longer remembers how to light the fire, and he does not know the word of the prayer but he is here in this place. And once again, God delivers his people. Finally, we get down to more modern times and Rabbi Israel Abrisi. He too faces a great challenge for his community. And he goes to God and he says, I cannot find the place in the forest. I do not know how to light the fire. And I cannot remember the words of the prayer. But I remember the story. And I pray that it will be enough. 
And it was. And it is. Through the night of doubt and sorrow, onward goes the pilgrim band, singing songs of expectation, marching to the promised land, clear before us through the darkness, Gleams and burns the guiding light. Pilgrim clasp the hand of pilgrim, Stepping fearless through the night. Onward, therefore, sisters, brothers, Onward with the cross arrayed. Bear its shame and fight its battle Till we rest beneath its shade Soon shall come the great awakening Soon the surrendering of the tomb Then the scattering of all shadows and the end of toil and gloom.